<laughs> it's my story and I'm sticking to it. All right, so how about that lunch? That was awesome. Yeah. That was, our, that was yeah. I had nothing to do with it, so don't clap for me. Uh, that was actually Revolution Rotisserie, if you guys haven't. Uh, check that place out, they're just over in OTR. Good, good people, it's actually Joel's roommate who's one of our developers, so. Um, cool, so hi, I'm Kevin. Uh, I'm Kevin. Um, I work here at Gaslight, and today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about um, an app that we built and kind of the process that we went through to do this and how we came upon it, and, um, and then we'll dive a little bit into the code. I'm not gonna go too deep into it, more just talk about like what we're building and what we're trying to do and how, how it happens. So, uh, so yeah, let's rewind back to February 2015. Um, we moved into this space, this beautiful, awesome space uh, from Blue Ash. And if you were ever in our... <laughs> well, when, when you had to work in a place with no windows, it kind of sucked. <laughs> I much prefer this space, just for the record. Um, so, February 2015, uh, we all got in a van, drove down here, set up this office, and then, um, you know, like the true hipster that I always aspire to be, uh, I was like, I'm going to be the urban professional, I'm going to ride the bus to work. And so, Monday morning comes, and I'm like, all right, how do I figure out when my bus is coming? And I go to the Metro website, and they're like, download this PDF. <laughs> And they're like, uh, yeah, so find your stop, and my stop, yeah, you gotta like, it took me, I kid you not, like 25 minutes to decipher this thing. And uh, so it figured out when, uh, when the bus was coming. And this was, if you remember back in, in February, um, there was like uh, snow <laughs> and and that Monday morning that I was coming to work, there was, it snowed like eight inches or something. And uh, so I go, go down to the bus stop at my scheduled time and it's freezing and I'm just standing there for like 15, 20 minutes and it was horrible. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm sitting there like, you know, this sucks. And that's what every bus rider at that moment in time said. Uh, and so we tried to, we started, it's because actually a lot of us here take the bus and so we started talking about what, how we could fix this. And about this time we figured, uh, or we found out that Metro had just released um, sort of under the radar because they were like afraid of people, afraid of showing their data to some people, but they, uh, they released a real-time API uh, which um, tells you where the buses are. So each bus that's running around Cincinnati has um, a tracker on it and it will t it knows when it's like entering and exiting a particular stop and then they send they have a feed that you can you can ask for that data so we were like well yes let's totally build something that can solve this problem and i don't have to sit for 20 minutes in the snow waiting for the bus to come so why, why did they build and expose that if they weren't going to do something like you did why did they why did they build it why did they expose that data who were they exposing it yeah, so, the, well, they, they ultimately were exposing it for people like us to build something. Uh, they were a little bit concerned about releasing it too early, so they had it, they had it on their server but didn't tell anybody about it, and we just happened to know someone that was like, hey, there's this thing over here. You should, like, check it out. Now, that, now it's officially publicized. They have it on their website, so you can, you can totally go and use their data as well. Um, they, they had been, so Metro had been spending a very long time trying to build their own real-time application and it didn't turn out too well, so they said, well, let's just open source the data and hopefully something happens, which it did, so that's awesome. Um, so we, uh, it was me and a couple other people who ride the bus and we were like, all right, what's, what's the minimum thing that we can possibly build to help us solve this? And uh, our first iteration of this thing was that. And I, I wanna stress like how stupidly simple this was it was like just pulling the real-time data for a stop and then tells you which, which buses are coming. Um, and it was so basic that like there weren't even links on the page. You had to like bookmark your stop ID with that crazy text up there, Mad High D. And it was like horrible, but it worked. It, it actually told us when the buses were coming, if they were late, um, which was cool. And we started using it. 
Um, and, and then, like, this crazy thing that happened, we started, we were using it at the bus stop, and everybody was like, what is that? How come you, what, how do you do that? How come, I want to use that. And, and so we were like, well, maybe there's, maybe there's something around this. Maybe we could, like, uh, maybe we could let other people use this and do things. So we got some of our designers involved, um, and one of our designers created this wonderfully cute logo and put a little bit more love into it and um, eventually came up with something that looks a little bit better, obviously, uh, that has, has some design to it, has um, a little bit of things. It's, it's still very basic, but this is sort of like a part-time fun project for us, but, uh, but at least it does something. And um, yeah, so this is Bus Detective. You can download it on the app stores and whatever. Um, if you are a bus rider, it is very useful. Um, as much as I love the bus, sometimes they're not the most timely things in the world. Um, so let's talk about some of the technology, at least the way it stands today. We've got um, some, some dreams and visions of the future that we'll also talk about. Um, but this is sort of how the back end works. So Metro publishes two APIs-ish. They're really not APIs. They are literally files that they put up on an FTP server and you read those files. Um, so not, a tr not an API in the traditional word. So they've got two things. They've got this scheduled data, which is um, essentially just CSV files of all the stops, all the like physical stop locations in Cincinnati, um, and a bunch of other stuff like times and different exceptions, they call them, which is like some buses only run on Saturdays, some only on Mondays, those, those sorts of things. And so those are, that's all static data that they only update like once every three months. So we copy that data into, um, into just a Postgres database and do some, um, just do the relationship stuff on it. And then they publish another thing, which is this real-time feed. Well, not really a feed, but um, so that's what actually gives you at this current moment, here are the times of when buses are supposed to arrive at different stops. And so uh, we're, in this case right now, we're using Rails. So when a phone asks for 7th and Walnut, we first, um, actually, I've got another slide for this. So we've got, um, we first query the scheduled times. So like all that data that we've got um, that says when the buses are scheduled to be, be there. This is actually um, a much more difficult problem when you get into the details. Um, when you actually look at these, at the, at the CSVs that they provide, it seems pretty simple. There's like stop times and there's stops and there's some other things. But when you actually get into the details of how a bus, like, because a bus actually has a route and that route changes when it gets to a certain point. So like coming down the street, it'll be in one route and then it hits government square and then that bus turns into another route. Even though it's the same number, it's like a different route that it's on. And so you have, to, you have to do some pretty complex calculations to figure out, like, given that this bus is on this route now, when is it going to be on the next route, and how you, like, calculate stuff. So, so we actually really dove into this data over a period of time, and I can show you some of the SQL that we have to do to, to get that stuff out. Um, it's, it's easy to solve the simple case, but then when you get into, like, I mean, there's just, like, crazy edge cases that you get into that's, um, it was fun to play around with. Um, all right, so yeah, we query the scheduled data, say when, when is this bus going, or when is it scheduled to be here, or what, what buses are scheduled to be here at this stop. And then once we get that, we turn around and we fetch the real-time data, and we say given these, maybe say it's six buses that are supposed to be here in the next hour, we fetch the real-time data, say, hey, do you have any updates or changes for these six buses? We shift those forward and backward in time based on whether they're, based on where they are. Uh, and yeah, so then we adjust the schedule data to show us that. So just real quick how this works. We've got uh, a request comes in that says, I want to see 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. for 7th and Walnut. That's the stop right out here. So we first select our scheduled data. This is a lot more complicated than that, but essentially we select times where uh, we stretch out the, the, what you're selecting or what you're asking for because when we get the real-time feed, you might have, um, you might have like an 820 or a 720 bus that's scheduled, but then it's delayed, so it's actually within the range of time that you're asking for. 
So we, we select uh, a, big, or a bigger set of data. So we get like all these points on, in, the, in the timeline of what you're asking for. And then we turn around and ask Metro for the real-time updates. And if we get, these are like shifts in time based on like this one was here and then Metro said actually it's gonna be behind by, or ahead of time by a couple minutes, this one behind, that sort of thing. And so we shift, shift, those, thing, shift those times along our little timeline. Like here, even though this bus was scheduled before 7.30, it's delayed and is actually coming after 7.30, so we have to do some bigger, bigger query than what we were asking for. And then, um, and then we send that back down to the user. So, uh, okay, so that's like the basic, the basic idea behind this. Pretty simple stuff, um, but the detail, the, the devil's in the details, as they always say. So, um, fast forward like a couple months after we built this thing, um, we were actually talking to one of the advertising companies that runs all the ads on the bus, because we wanted to actually put a gaslight logo on all the buses and have it drive around. Um, so we just wanted to meet with this guy and see how much it costs to put a logo on a bus. Uh, so we met, meet with this um, person and he's like, yeah, you know, it costs this much for a big giant wrap of the whole bus, costs this much for like a little sign on the back. And then we were like, oh yeah, yeah, cool. And then we showed him this app. We were like, yeah, here's this thing. We like know where the buses are at intervals of time. And like we, calcul we can calculate these things. And, and, uh, and so he, he's like, oh yeah, cool, cool, keeps talking. And then all of a sudden he's like go halfway through his speech and he just stops and he's like, wait a second. He's like, you guys know where the buses are? <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, yeah. And he was, like, he was like, so you mean I could give you like a list of bus IDs and you could tell me like where those buses went last month? And we were like, yeah, yeah, we could totally tell you that. And he was like, do you have any idea how useful that would be to my business? <laughs> because right now, the way that, that it works and the way, that, uh, the way that every advertising company that has relationships with these metro systems, uh, the way that it works is uh, the, um, so Dunkin' Donuts might call up this advertising company and say, I want to put, you know, Dunkin' Donuts wraps on 15 buses or something in Cincinnati. Uh, and so they will, they will call Metro and say, hey Metro, we need 15 buses. Metro sends them 15 buses, they put the wraps on it, they do all the graphics, they, and then they send those buses back to Metro. Once that happens, they have no idea what happens to those buses. Those buses could sit in a garage for six months or be running up and down 71. They have no idea. And so uh, obviously, if you're an advertiser, like that data is kind of helpful. So this, this data that we're collecting can do that. So, we came up with this idea to build Bus Detective Pro, which is, <laughs> which is a, uh, it's, it's um, a way to do this, a way to expose some of these advertising um, uh, demographics and things to, uh, to advertisers. And so... And were you actually <clears throat> changing, doing anything with the data that benefited them, or just the fact that you sucked it down and stored it and then could play it back? Yeah, so let's let's show you what we built. So we're doing a little. I mean, we're doing a lot more with uh, this Bus Detector Pro thing. So um, here's an example of the GTFS feed. I'll show you that in a second. So this is the idea behind it. So Full Throttle is a company that does. Um, they do the go kart tracks up in Sharonville, I think, and uh, they they've got a campaign that where they've got like buses that they've paid to wrap with their advertisements running around. So we can say, here's their advertising campaign. They've got these vehicles and we can track where those vehicles were. And uh, we, they, they like to know things by zip codes so we can tell them how many times buses went through different zip codes. And then we actually query some census data and break down like what their ethnicities are and demographics and some, some things like that. So this is, this is essentially an MVP of what we're going to tr start selling to these advertisers. But um, so this is, this is running the same data. Essentially, it's the same, it's the same thing that Bus Detective, the consumer app, is doing. It's pulling down locations and times and when buses are coming, except it's storing that and allowing us to do some analysis on it. Um, and this, we decided to um, build in Phoenix and Elixir. Um, 
I have a lot of experience in Rails. A lot of people in this room do as well. And um, we, uh, we decided to do this one in Elixir because I think that I, as much as I like Ruby and everything, we run into issues of scalability and uh, you know, real timeiness that is sad. And so we, we decided to do this one in Elixir just to see how it went. So I'll talk a little bit about my experience as a Rails developer making the switch to uh, Elixir and Phoenix and sort of what, what the pitfalls might be and some of the things that I found really, really nice about it. Um, yeah, and so... On the visualization there, so it looks yeah. like the, the, the vehicles are, are those points. Yes, correct. So is that like a point? So right now that is literally a point that we captured. So that is like a bus. We, we asked like, when, where is the buses? And that is a literal physical point of where that bus was at that point in time. We're only, okay. we're only polling these things every like five minutes we're asking because we don't want to store every location ever. Check, and check the check boxes, Oh yeah, you can filter these things. You could say like, where is, ah. is, is the API free or is there like yeah. a cost? Is, is no, no, a, no cost is free and yes. So, f well right now it is literally just a, it is a public file on their web server, and like I said, it's it's literally an FTP server that has files on it that they just replace every 30 seconds. So um, you have the sample points, and in theory, you can map that to like, okay, well, yeah, this bus was spotted here, and yeah, that is part of this route. Exactly. So okay. we we have all that data. We we just haven't gotten to the point of of doing the, yeah. the route lines and all that. But you're right. Like if we, if we capture one point during a five minute or even like a 25 minute period that says this bus was on this route at this time, we know that yes, it traveled like through all these other places, even though we just captured one, one point. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so Phoenix. So Chris talked a lot about Phoenix this morning, um, and I just wanted to maybe do like a, a high-level overview of some of the some of the things that we found Phoenix to be really cool, or things that, to be cool about um, Elixir and Phoenix and some of those things. So, like Chris said, Phoenix is or Elixir. I keep messing those two. Elixir is the language that is built on top of the Erlang VM. It's a functional language. It's an immutable language. And um, it allows you to do some things that are like completely impossible in more object-oriented languages like, uh, like Ruby. So one of, the, one of the things that it allows you to do is um, these things called pipelines. This is the pipeline operator. And if you're familiar with you know, a lot of functional principles, the idea is that you're constantly just transforming data from one form or one state to another state. And we can do that in Elixir in a, these really kind of nice ways using pipelines. So we can, um, we can fetch here. We're like fetching this real-time API. We're decoding it using, these are sent back, and back from their server in protobuf format, which is like a Google uh, data, data transport uh, format. So we decode that and then we can just pipe these things through different things. So we can extra extract uh, a change set, which is essentially a, uh, Phoenix's version of a, of a thing that you're going to enter into a database. Uh, we can do some other things, and then we can just insert it into our database and do some things. So we're actually using streams in this case. Streams are just a way to kind of do uh, a little bit more parallel processing of data. And then, um, yeah, so that's, that's sort of one of the things that, that, that is kind of nice about Elixir. Um, if you're from a Rails world, you have a lot of the same things that you would see, right? You've got controllers. Controllers have actions on them like index and show and those sorts of things. Um, and then you can render, render stuff. One, one of the things that I really dig about the Phoenix framework that uh, kind of deviates from a more traditional Rails style is that you have this notion of a built-in presenter pattern. So in Rails, you have 
you have the model, the view, uh, you, you have the model, the controller, and then the view. And the view in Rails is like your HTML, and you pass data from your controller straight to the view, and then you render it inside the view. And if you want to do, uh, if you want to do some more complex presentation of your data, you have to kind of build that yourself. So you can do two things. You can like do all this stuff in the controller where you're setting up like doing calculations in the controller. That's like a horrible thing to do. So keep your controllers light, lightweight. And then um, so what a lot of a, a pattern that a lot of people come up with is the is the presenter pattern where you query some data, you pass it to a presenter object, and then you pass that presenter object to a view, and then the view can ask the presenter to do some more complex stuff to uh, kind of break up, break, up your, uh, break up your stuff. So in Phoenix, we have built-in presenter patterns. So in Phoenix, you have these things called views, which are really a traditional presenter. And you can do things in, in there like you can, I mean, in this case, we're just rendering JSON, but you can do more complex stuff, right? You can say like, I want to combine two different ob or two different um, database fields into one thing. I can do like some more complex stuff. So I found that to be really helpful. I, I mean, we use presenters in a lot of cases, but it's really nice to have it built into the framework. Um, yeah, so that's views. And then you have templates, which actually, if you're rendering HTML, this app really isn't rendering any HTML. But uh, you've got templates there. And yep, models are like your, there is a, the, the baked in, um, it's not really an ORM, it's a data mapper pattern, but it's a, it's a way of, of mapping your domain objects to your database. And uh, so this is using a thing called Ecto to do that. Um, let's see, what else we got? Controllers. And then like Chris talked about, the other, the other main thing that is baked into Phoenix is the, the idea of channels. And a channel is a way to do real-time WebSocket push communication to, um, to your client, and that's sort of a baked in idea there. Um, yeah, so I will say after my month or something building this in Phoenix, um, while the framework seems similar in a, to a Rails perspective, if you're coming from a Rails world or any, any sort of like more traditional MVC uh, web framework, um, there is a big difference in making the jump from a object-oriented framework to a functional framework. It is definitely a mind shift that you have to, that it, it, I mean, it just takes time to like grok all the things that are going on and really how to like think about things in more of a data transform way instead of like this object thing where you're changing, doing immutable or mutating state in objects. Um, but after, I mean, you really, I, it didn't take me too, too long to like after a few weeks of doing this, I sort of did the anti-pattern way where I was thinking of it and trying to create these more object-y things that I was trying to mutate and then, and then I would realize that that was a stupid idea and figure out, figure out the, the more functional way to do it. Um, and I'm not claiming I'm an expert in any way, but it is really nice to kind of open your eyes to this more like functional um, paradigms, really, really cool things. So, um, yeah. So let's see, there was some other stuff I was gonna show. Um, this is some of the crazy SQL that we have to do. Uh, and this is only some of it. We actually have some built in, we're, we've got some Postgres views that are doing some like pivot pivot table stuff to figure out like really complex edge cases around when buses start and, and stop. So uh, yeah, so this is, this is the real time feed. This is the scheduled feed. So this is like if you go and download Metro's scheduled stop data, it literally comes in just CSV format where we've got stops, where those stops are, uh, lat longs of the stops, and then, and then you get some things like these stop times, which say given, given a stop and a bus at a certain time when that bus is gonna come. And then there's all these other things about calendars and how times change in different times of the year, and it's kind of crazy. 
yeah, so check it out. It's all open, open data. And if you want to build a bus app or Sun Transit app, it's all free stuff, so you can just use it. Um, yeah, so that's really all I had. Any questions? Yeah. You said you were doing uh, protocol buffers before the Ruby and use. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So this is a great, great lead-in question, James. Um, so one, one of the things that this app has to do, so the, the real-time feed comes in protobuf format, which is like a, uh, I don't know if it's binary. I think it's, I think it's binary. Uh, data feed, and we were in, in Ruby, we are taking that, we are converting the protobuf data into uh, like a hash, and in Ruby that is painfully slow. It literally takes like upwards of a half a second to parse a protobuffer into a hash, and when you have a ton of clients that are asking for this data, it can be pretty painful. So we, we ran into a, a bunch of scaling issues in trying to do the trying to do those protobuf um, computations. So when we switched to Phoenix and switched to Elixir, we just installed the default protobuf library that's out there, ran it, and it was like milliseconds to convert the protobuf to the um, uh, Elixir map. So that's kind of cool, right? Like out of the box, <laughs> much better performance. So, yeah. Um, so on your uh, example there where you were showing off Phoenix, mm -hmm. um, so where do you define like the page layout? The page, la well, so if, so the front end of this app is built in Ember, so all of that stuff is handled in Ember and we're just talking to the server via JSON. Okay. But if you were to do it, you would do it in this templates thing. So here's like our layout for, uh, the app, but all this really does is spit out a JavaScript file, which is our Ember app, and then Ember renders the whole thing. So, okay. um, but it's very similar to Rails in that you have, you know, this is the equivalent to your yield tag, but it's that's just a like spit out the, the rest of this page here. So if you weren't using uh, a, uh, a JavaScript MVC, you could build the, yes. the templates in the same way. Yes, you build build the templates in the same in the same way, way here. You can drop down into Elixir code in the same way you do in Rails with these sort of like the percent equals things. Um, and then, the, like I was saying, you still have this notion of a view, which is the presenter from the data that you've got you've fetched from your controller gets given to the view, and then the view exposes that to the template. Yeah. And from there, you can do you, you can do transforms and all that stuff. So are basically that's true. They get compiled. So on, at at build time, these templates get compiled down into raw functions. And I've been told that it's like crazy fast, right? Like, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. So how long did it take you to hook up uh, Rails and Ember and Cordova to all work together? How long? Um, well, so our Cordova app is literally just pointing to a URL. It's not doing any any like client side stuff. So in terms of actually setting up Cordova, it was like painless. I mean, what about um, I mean the first the first literal version this thing. Ah, where am I? So this version took us. Uh, an afternoon, which was just like the first MV MVP of this thing. To do this took more time because we actually did the right things and like had a real server that was actually fetching stuff. And so that that take that took us, I don't know, a, I don't have an hour number for you, but <laughs> a few hours, more than a few hours probably. So is it getting a lot of use? Yeah, yeah, it is. We get um, we have about a thousand daily users in Cincinnati that use it. Um, you know, it's nothing. It's nothing remarkable, but it's enough that people are using it, which is nice. We do have we we are planning to eventually like add this to different cities. There's no reason we couldn't just like turn it on for every every city that has a real time feed. 
it's just more like this is still a hobby project for us, so we don't want to give ourselves too much work. But there's mm -hmm. something in the media about you guys were going to try to put uh, screens and like local establishments. Yes. So that's that's actually another thing. Let's see if I can find that. I think it's. Um, uh, where is that? Bus. Let's see. Bus. Yeah, this is a thing that a couple of UC grads, these guys. Yeah, so this is um, this is a cool project actually. This is um, a couple of guys at in the uh, geography department at UC. They're grad students, and they won a People's Liberty Grant, which is um, just these grants where you can get ten grand to like go build something. And their idea is that they're going to take cheap <coughs> tablets like the Android tablets that you can buy for 100 bucks or something, and load up uh, an app like what you see there and stick them in like storefront windows. And, and so somebody that's standing at the bus stop can see when their bus is coming, even if they don't have a phone or a real-time feed. And then they were also going to like give these to you know, bars to put behind the bar to like show people when the next buses are coming. Um, they are, so we met them, and they were in the process of starting to hash out this thing of how they were going to build it, and they were, ha they were getting really tripped up on the, on the server side back end, and so we were like, well, hey, you can just like use our API and query our data instead of having to like do all the parsing and, and SQL yourself. So their, their signs, which I think they're starting to, I don't know if they're live yet, but they're pretty close, if not in, starting to go out. So behind, they've got their own UI that they built to do that like, like sort of signage style thing, but they're just querying the bus detective data behind the scenes. So. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it's a cool idea. Those, and and it, was, it was cool to talk to them because they actually know way more than we do about this GTFS data. GTFS is the, is the Google protocol for communicating transit times and things. And these guys are like have grad degrees in this stuff and they know all about post GIS and like how to query this stuff and like it was really cool to talk to them. Um, they just don't have the expertise in doing like server side languages for a web app. So um, it's cool cool partnership there. Um, yeah. And we spent the day with them kind of building the MVP the MVP of this. Yes, it's going to be put right into the same database. So as soon as the streetcar starts, our app will have the streetcar stops. And we're going to have to come up with a different name than Bus Detective because so Michelle bought the, our marketing person bought the domain streetcarsleuth.com. So, <laughs> so we, might, we might do that as well. Are you going to go back to Rails for the streetcar? No. <laughs> but, um, where's the drum set? Yeah. Um, prior to this project, what was your experience with Elixir and Phoenix? Goose egg. So yeah. what resources did you consult um, yeah. yourself in order to become more familiar with the Phoenix? So I read the Dave Thomas book, uh, Programming Elixir, is that it? Yeah, that's a really good book to kind of he just talks about the data structures and the paradigms and the, the things kind of from, from nothing. And that was really helpful. Um, let's see, going through the, uh, there's a site called Elixir Sips, which is similar to like Railscast, and then it's just videos of how to do various things in Elixir. Those are really helpful. I, you do have to pay for most of those, but I think it's totally worth it. And they're really cheap, so you should totally buy them. Uh, what else? The docs, I, I am just blown away by how good the Elixir docs are. Um, they, uh, even though the language is still fairly new, the docs are like super helpful and they have, I mean, it, it, every function has, uh, this is like the top level thing, but everything has examples of how to use it in the terminal, in the like, in code. And really, really helpful. Yeah. It's worth pointing out those are action tests. Those examples are doc tests. 
that are executed. So, so they don't work in these documentation <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I think that, you know, there's a, there's a, I, I, I feel like there is, a, even, even though the Elixir language is still relatively new, it literally started in what, 2011? Was the, or 2012 maybe? Okay, maybe, maybe before that. Oops. <laughs> yeah. So it's still a very new language, but in terms of the tooling and the, it it feels very very mature. You know, there's these there's a thing that you will interact with in the when you're building a thing called Mix, and Mix is a. Uh, it is a combination of, if you're in the Ruby land, it's a combination of rake and bundler and what else? Gems. Yeah, so it does your package management for you. It does, it runs your tests. It can do all the stuff. Uh, it does compilation. Well, compilation is done kind of under the, behind the scenes. But, um, but mix is, I mean, it just, it feels like, all of the lessons that sort of the Ruby community learned over the past 10 years were just kind of like streamlined into, into like a really mature tooling set for Elixir. And I've, I've been really happy with it. I mean, it's just, it just feels much, much wiser than its years, I would say. And, and the, the nice part about Phoenix is it's, it's very much a uh, convention over configuration language or uh, framework in that when you Phoenix new it builds you a whole directory structure there's no there's no trying to figure out like where do I put my files how do I do something there's built-in generators to sort of get you started that is to me is like a huge help when you're learning a language or learning a learning a framework and uh, so that's really nice but also you know I, I, I'm back in the olden days of rails it was like you had this golden path and you could not get out of it. And it took a really long time for the Rails community to get, 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 to get to the point where you could break out of the kind of traditional, just like model view controller mindset. Uh, and it, it used to just have to jump through a bunch of hoops to do that. Now in Phoenix, it, I, I had no problem just like creating my own modules that were not tied to Phoenix and testing them independent of Phoenix. And uh, it just felt like there was a lot of that decoupling sort of built in. So that was, that was good. On the flip side, did you run into any places in Phoenix where you're like, uh, I wish we got some Rails? <laughs> yes. Oh, it's, oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. So it's definitely not all unicorns and rainbows. The, uh, the Ecto, which is the sort of data mapper, the equivalent to Active Record and Rails, is still very, very new, and in my opinion, like, has just a lot of quirks that need to be sorted out. And um, so it's, it does some nice things, but it still just feels very, to do like simple cases sometimes is very painful. It's getting better, but it's, it's still not a, a real rich query language yet. I almost wish they would like go more, uh, more in like embrace SQL route and just like write SQL to do this stuff, but it's trying to like add this big layer of abstraction on top of SQL, which is really kind of tough. Uh, so there's that. There's other other random things like getting, you know, we, we really feel strongly about writing feature tests, browser different driven feature tests for stuff. Um, that's I'm, actually, there is a pretty good story for doing that in Phoenix using a library called Hound, which is equivalent to like Capybara and Rails, which is actually drives the browser and clicks on things and does some stuff. So, um, so I was able to get that set up, but it was there were some quirks around doing that sort of stuff. Uh, so that even though the core of the language feels very mature, there's still I mean there's there's just a lot of libraries that don't exist yet because they, they just haven't been enough time. So it's getting better, but it's going to be a while before it's like just feels super, super streamlined. Yeah, I think I'm probably over time maybe. So. Cool. Well, that's it. Thanks. <laughs>